So uh, this this event, uh, I'm calling it rethinking development, uh, field from the notes. Uh, so notes from the field, uh, rethinking how we do research, and and why are we doing this? Um, uh, let me start uh, uh, with a quote uh, by a renowned uh, economist uh, that uh, Amritya Sen that uh, development professional that we all know of. And what he said in, in his, uh, one of his books was that we live in a world of unprecedented opulence um, of a kind that would have been hard even to imagine a century or two, uh, century or two ago. Yet we live in a world that also has remarkable deprivation, destitution, and oppression. So uh, these are the things that we are seeing across the board now. We are seeing them uh in the us we're seeing them in pakistan we're seeing them in india i mean this is uh, what we're all focused on we're suddenly talking about health and we're certainly talking about uh our relationship to the environment we're not talking about conflicts anymore we're not talking about uh, mega development projects uh so where does that leave us uh when it comes to our collective research agendas so i, I pose this question uh, to the panelists and, and we'll start with Nosheen and then we can go to Danish and then come to Wakar. Uh, so the question is this, given the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has virtually brought the wor world to a standstill, how do you see it affecting changing the research agenda as it pertains to your work? Um, we all understand the importance of the human dimension uh, when it comes to development, but does the current crisis offer a window of opportunity to address it? So kindly answer this and, and uh, please uh, do talk about some of your recent work if you can uh, while do, doing so. Uh, may I request Dr. Nosheen to kindly start us off. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much Imran. And uh, it's uh, really a privilege to be part of this uh, panel discussion and at SDPI. And uh, thank you very much Imran for uh, inviting me to, to uh, be a part of this discussion today. So uh, the question to Apne posed kya, it's an incredibly important one. So in this present conjuncture of a global pandemic, uh, there are several issues, of course, and one, can, one could talk about these issues from different vantage points, from different disciplinary orientations. But for me, uh, a couple of things that have been very clearly brought to the forefront, kind of have been laid bare uh, by this current pandemic is uh, evidently the pervasive, extreme uh, socio-spatial inequalities uh, that have uh, sort of, you know, been part and parcel of uh, Pakistan's development over the last 60, 70 years or so. These are issues that some of us have been uh, writing about and talking about for a long time. And, uh, but where they've sort of come to the forefront in a very big way. And in my own work, I'm speaking specifically of um, of an urban majority across Pakistan's many different cities uh, that comprise working class, poor, uh, lower income, lower to middle income uh, citizens or populations who have been uh, the most impacted or, or impacted the most by the present crisis. But this impact isn't just about questions of uh, food supply, although that is uh, a very important one, or the loss of incomes, but also uh, over the last 40 or 50 years, how urban planning dynamics have uh, socio-spatially pushed these different populations literally on the margins of, uh, of, uh, of society. And, and the spatial dynamic is, of course, playing into this also in very important ways. So uh, how does this present context of the pandemic impact research agendas? So, um, so pandemics, diseases aren't something that I was considering or thinking about until this present moment. And now it's kind of sort of blasted itself in, uh, you know, into our faces in a very important way. So this is one thing, issues of proximity, issues of density uh, in working class settlements, uh, the spread of disease, this, you know, these interconnections have come forward in very important ways. Although uh, in, in my own work and in my collaborations with colleagues like Danish, who is also part of our panel today, uh, we have been looking at issues of, uh, of contamination and so forth through uh, things like the provision of water or the lack of provision of water, water scarcity issues. But for me personally, the issue of disease or the spread of disease 
uh, wasn't uh, priority number one and health concerns, these kinds of things. So this is one issue that has obviously come up in a very, very big way now. And, uh, and uh, what are some of the sort of glaring deficiencies in, uh, in research? Uh, for me right now, sort of the gaps, the lacunae. One thing that is very big that comes in front of you is that as we are sort of watching, observing uh, the, this particular situation unfold, this crisis of, uh, of a pandemic and how it's, hit, it's hitting hard specific populations within Pakistan's urban centers, uh, how will this particular dynamic interact with the broader context of climate change related agendas. And for me, this is a very important issue. So uh, again, when we're looking at high density settlements, I mean, I work from the ground up, so that's, that's the, the first, the primarily sort of, that's my anchor point. So when we're looking at high density income poor settlements, I mean, if you Karachi just share up lately, this is a, a large metropolis where 62% of the city's population resides in informal settlements, and there's a wide variety of toponyms that can be applied to describe them, slums, informal settlements, kachiabadis, unplanned settlements, jhopuris, uh, you know, mukhtalif kisam kisam ke ki categories hain, jo istamal ho sakti hain, ko describe karne ke liye. To jab aap itne sare log jo deprived hain of basic infrastructures and have been deprived for a very long time, which is a crisis, by the way, is a daily occurrence. So, we are looking this pandemic from a specific vantage point, where we are looking at a very big crisis. And obviously, this crisis has different manifestations come, even for the, for the poor. But at a very fundamental level, this infrastructure crisis, water crisis, livelihood crisis, ghar, housing crisis, these crises have been an ongoing part of the urban majority's life. For, for, for a long time now. And of course, these crises have been multiplied and this particular moment of the pandemic has brought these forward uh, to the forefront in a very big way. But as we go forward in thinking about uh, research agendas, you know, climate change ka jo scenario hai in terms of uh, heat, temperatures, these kinds of things and how these might interact with the issue of pandemics because this uh, from what I understand, uh, you know, this virus is going to linger going forward. It's not going to disappear overnight. Uh, how will these particular issues interact and how might we as researchers, how could we start considering uh, in, a, in a more concrete fashion uh, co new conceptual frameworks or, or thinking about these kinds of, of you know, relationships? So, so I, I just wanted to touch upon that uh, and hopefully we can, as we go forward, expand on this discussion further with our colleagues bringing in their own uh, opinions and uh, points of view. Thank you, Nasheen. May, may I please ask a follow-up question to this? So uh, you, you recently wrote a, a very nice article in the dawn as well that, that highlighted your study in Karachi and talked about, uh, you know, these dense areas that we, we don't venture into and we don't talk about. And uh, while we are, uh, you know, in a lockdown position in our homes and with Wi-Fi, there are people who are out there, perhaps they don't have clean drinking water, they don't have the sanitation facilities. So uh, if, if I may, why doesn't, why don't these problems that have been around for such a long time don't resonate with the policymakers? Uh, is, uh, as researchers, we like to publish our findings, you know, they're peer reviewed journals, we, we like to like to write a lot of reports. Uh, when do you think my, come a time when these start to resonate uh, in the halls of power, for example? I think that in the Pakistani context, uh, much of the discussions on issues of informality, informal settlements, it's uh, their relationship, sort of the spatial condition, the built, question of the built environment, and its uh, social, political, economic dynamics simply don't resonate because the urban does not resonate in broader policy conversations. This is my point of view. And when the urban dimension does resonate, it tends to uh, it tends to kind of uh, filter through discourses of urban growth, cities as engines of growth. That is the typical mantra when it comes up. And uh, and I of course find that very frustrating because uh, that really sort of uh, kind of lays bare the uh, the very uh, limited uh, uh, you know 
ways in which uh, policymakers and even researchers have taken up uh, the urban condition in Pakistan. And if we compare this, for instance, uh, with what is happening in parts of Africa, in South Africa, for instance, jahan par, uh, you have, um, uh, I mean, this is, I'm not romanticizing it by any means, but I'm just sort of giving this particular uh, example just to drive home a point that in South Africa, you have a Ministry of Human Settlements which takes up this issue of informality and informal settlements and slums in a, in a very productive fashion, which is not to suggest that their issues are but simply to say that there is a very uh, important and uh, a very significant uh, way in which the government of South Africa has approached this question of poverty, specifically through the lens of slums and informality and informal settlements, by taking it up in a, in a very substantive and productive fashion in policymaking agendas. But in Pakistan, the urban doesn't resonate uh, through the prism of, and when it does, it's kind of, you know, rural versus urban, we'll be debating both sort of a linger katta raha hai or bohat ki limited kism ka debate hai, which gets stuck in issues of numbers and categories, etc. And uh, so I think we need broader conversations, we need innovative conversations, uh, and, and, and we need multidisciplinary conversations. You know, it's not just economists but also anthropologists, geographers, uh, uh, planners, ethnographers, psychologists, everyone needs to be a part of this debate in Pakistan, along with policymakers, to take up the urban in ways that are far more innovative than where we are at right now in Pakistan, which is really, uh, we haven't made much uh, progress beyond the cities as engine of growth, while our discourse, which I think is very damaging in terms of how we sort of aspire to study cities and the Khaskar now because uh, Pakistan ki jo urban population here even if the census says it's at 32 percent it's actually not it's considerably higher or uh, or and and this particular pandemic moment is it's a crisis of the urban especially when we start looking at issues of poverty and density etc so I think ab bakt aagya hai ki hume ye urban dimension bhi bhoat serious tarikhe se or an innovative tarikhe se isko Skolena has researchers in order to go forward with uh, with our research agenda. Uh, th thank, thank you, Nosheen. Uh, let's turn to Danish now. And so the, Danish has also been working on this urban and rural divide. You know, he's work, been working on the Dakota system. I don't know whether he wants to bring that. In. The same question to you, Danish. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, when I was listening to Nosheen, I was like, oh, okay, she said everything I was going to say. So what do I say now? <laughs> so becomes a wee bit of a uh, issue to follow that up. I have to endorse and agree with everything that Nosheen has said and then add a little bit that as far as my personal uh, research agenda is concerned, nothing is going to change because I don't think anything has changed with this particular uh, epidemic. Uh, if you recall, I wrote some time back, uh, three, four weeks back, okay, the same sort of ideas and hazards that we've been talking about regarding vulnerability, regarding exclusion, regarding adverse human environment relations, everything that has its geographers have been talking about for the past 40 years has been put again into a sharp relief as a result of this COVID virus, just as it was during the 2010 uh, flood, just as it was during the drought in Tharparka, just as, as it was in 2005 earthquake, just as, as it was in 1992 floods, whatever, you know. <laughs> it's just so boringly, nauseatingly repetitious uh, that this thing is happening. Oh my God, everybody is in quarantine. Wait a minute. You know, Sheen and I did some work in uh, Afghanabadi back then. All the population, women population, were under quarantine. Quarantine from Bihayai. You know, Bihayai is a disease as well. You're worried about COVID-19, people are worried about Bihayai. And westernization is a disease. I mean, I, got, I took stones uh, walking in uh, the Bharat March where to be a woman and to be standing, to be claiming a particular space and a place for being there was a cause for people to throw stones at you, right? So have a chat with them about, wow, what a brave new world it is that you're quarantined, no shit. You know, for once the husband is sitting at home or the father is sitting at home or the brother is sitting at home and actually having the kind of life that a certain gender in our society is at times condemned to because there is this disease you know, an infectious disease of Beshermi, Behayai, and what have you outside there. Do you see what I'm saying? So metaphorically and practically and materially, I don't see anything has changed, right? Oh, okay, yeah, right. So you can't really run away from it, right? You can't really fly off to Australia and be quarantined from it or be away from it. That's not frightfully exciting either because for most of the people, 
living in the flood zones. It's not an option to step into a car or buy an airfare or whatever and get out of the flood plain or get out of a seismically active zone or to get out of a informal settlement, right? I mean, people are not having a grand old time in Shiri Jana colony, which, you know, she was very kind to take me over there. And she's worked in Ali Akbar Shagot. Have a chat with her about how much of a choice is it for people in Ali Akbar Shagot to actually pick up and leave from there. So hello, welcome to the lives of others, as, as one would say. So nothing has changed in that respect. Fine, uh, we have a particular juncture, just as we've had 15 other junctures, at least as long as I've been research active, where we thought that someone's gonna listen, we thought that someone's gonna say something. Uh, we thought that there's gonna be a resonance, and there was for a few weeks, and then there wasn't, and life moved on. So forgive me for being a little cynical about there. You're right. I mean, the, I, I understand where you're coming from, and, you, and and thank you for being frank. But then you've got this other hat on too, right? You, you're a researcher. Uh, you go out and you, you talk to your students. Uh, do you want to give them hope? Uh, do you want to give uh, them a sense of uh, an opportunity to do, make make things better? And 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 if you're if you're doing that, how 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 can they approach you? How can people who really want to do it? In, in, uh, we're, we're coming to this age, coming to this, this, they're learning a new about this and they want to make a difference. And we're not talking about the individuals who've seen this before and had these policy reports in front of them and haven't made a decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, just, I just find the notion of hope a very strange one. On the one hand, I find this one of the most hopeful messages that what is happening at the moment is not divine retribution. It is not a random act that has happened that nature has sprung upon you. It is not that the stars are misaligned or something like that. It is a function of who we are and how we have produced ourselves. And we have a social choice to produce ourselves differently. What that's saying to me is an incredible amount of power which is in your hand to, hands to jeopardize yourself and equally to also reinvent yourself collectively to avoid these sorts of situations in the, in, in the future. That sounds like an incredibly hopeful and optimistic view to me, and for some reason is deemed to be incredibly pessimistic by others. I do not understand that how did we get to a point where we can imagine alternate universes, we can imagine all sorts of monsters lurking uh, under the ground and in the skies and under the water and what have you, and, but we cannot imagine ourselves differently from the way we are. So it sounds to me, on the, on a, in a very philosophical kind of a plane, that perhaps what I am saying is deeply hopeful because it is saying, we did it, we broke it, we can fix it, right, as, as humans. It's, it's a social process. Now, the fact that we find that very incredibly pessimistic, oh my God, so it's a social process, we cannot change socially. Well, then, what do you want me to say? <laughs> that said, uh, I, I can understand that that might be a little less digestible uh, I, I, beyond the rhetorical and cutesy sort of a <laughs> challenge that I may have thrown out there. Let me just uh, step back and say that, well, all changes are brought about, are predicated and premised upon the consent of the people, upon a social consent, right? At the moment, very simple sort of a uh, insight that I bring, uh, that, I, that you know, we in Hazard's research have been talking about since forever, is about command and control approach versus a problem-solving approach towards vulnerability reduction, towards hazard risk reduction, and so on and so forth. Now, what does the problem-solving approach mean? Uh, the command and control approach means that you're dealing with a rogue population where a hierarchical model of authority where decisions taken by an all-wise someone sitting upstairs filters down through the hierarchy and eventually things gonna change. And it is coming from that stupid Napoleonic uh, corporate militarist model, right? Napoleon inv essentially invented the modern military and it's a hierarchical sort of a model of command and control, which uh, subsequently all colonial militaries adopted and it was transferred over into the corporate sector as well, where the, th the thinking that top-down unity of command and all of that nonsense that everyone is so incredibly enthralled with, if you will, in the military and the government sector, essentially gets transferred into dealing with human environment relations, if you will. Where the assumption is that multiple modes or nodes of decision-making, multiple centers of power will just be flattened out into an ISO static plane where 
you sitting in the panopticon have the have the liberty of actually interacting with it and dealing with it and changing it in in profound kinds of ways because you're the wise you're the general you are the prime minister you're the president you're the deputy commissioner or the commissioner or what have you right that's the assumption the problem solving mode is essentially saying society is diverse you know there are multiple strands of authority there are multiple subjectivities in there and how do you take this diverse hodgepodge of a society together into a certain direction, which is a process of negotiation, which is a process of acknowledging those multiple centers, and then recruiting them in a, in a radically democratic sort of a register uh, to get, gain their consent in order to change things. For example, let's talk about social distancing, or let's talk about hygiene, or let's talk about what needs to, or distribution of rations, or talk about rent control, or any of those things. Local level knowledge, local level representation, local government that Nasheen has been talking about since forever. Uh, I've been talking about it, less so than uh, Nasheen, much more so. Those are absolutely critical to getting anything done. The chief minister can yell all he wants, the prime minister of our country can uh, enlighten us with all of his wisdom, all he wants, so the general staff can order whatever he wants. Eventually, if it doesn't make a difference in a street, at the street level, at the household level, at a, at a, at a uh, union council level, taluka level, it doesn't matter. And the only way it will make a difference is not because you made the yeah, you know, have them run around the certain or call them names or what have you. It's not going to work like that. It hasn't worked in 200 years. It's not going to work today. And that's where there are very sensible sorts of ideas, which are not incredibly complex or profound kinds of ideas, but those are ideas we've been talking about in urban sociology or in hazard geography since forever, for decades. So, now, the question is, okay, if it's done, now it's done, everyone is hanging out at home, don't have much to do, so maybe they have time to listen to us again. And then once uh, you open the doors, they'll forget again. Being cynical over here, but it's a, it's, a, it's a process. There is no magic bullet over here. You know, Shane will keep, keep at what she does. I'll keep at what I do. And that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let, let me turn to Wakar now. Uh, we talked about this yesterday as well. We talked about the state of uh, hospitals in the country. Um, and given what Roshin just said and what Zanis just said, uh, there's this, uh, you know, in, in, in the public policy paradigm, John Kingdon says that there are windows of opportunity that arise during crises and those windows of opportunity uh, are very short term and you have to make it. So the question that I posed to them earlier and, and then perhaps also think about whether this is a, a window of opportunity for not only Pakistan, but for other countries in the world as well, to really rethink the way we approach development and we, we uh, rethink how we approach uh, a research agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Imran, for the opportunity. And uh, let me also thank uh, Noshin Sahiba and uh, Danish Saab for really educating us uh, here. I've, I've really been blown away by some, some very good uh, observations here. and. Uh, I, I really appreciate them taking time out and being available for this uh, uh, STPI meeting. Uh, let me just start by uh, resonating with what Danish Sa was saying, and uh, probably I think uh, a large part of the solution uh, lies in uh, developing our understanding uh, around enabling local systems to work. And maybe at some level, uh, let me confess that uh, it is a, a sort of a collective failure that maybe uh, we could have contributed more uh, well before uh, this this uh, COVID uh, issue came in. Um, but then again, of course, I see uh, this as an opportunity uh, of a huge scale uh, for at least uh, the research community that they are having to see uh, real time uh, how challenges are evolving and of course researchers are being forced out of their own comfort zone to think uh, uh, how to connect with those challenges one and second how to uh, uh, help policymakers 
in responding uh, to those challenges. And now I'm speaking as an STPI person because that's what our mandate is to stand ready and uh, help uh, the governments, uh, may they be at federal, provincial, or sub provincial levels. So uh, I, I think uh, I, I, uh, the discussion which we have just done and what you have uh, posed as a question, I draw a lot of lessons. Uh, on on the subject of uh, uh, promoting uh, the use of evidence uh, within the policy making community for example uh, the the earlier discussion around why uh, wasn't uh, urban being seen as uh, being seen through a lens other than let's say uh, economy or uh, as an engine of growth is 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 something which gives us a very good uh, problem statement uh, going forward and and certainly uh, also gives us uh, the opportunity to think of covid not just as uh, a health or a lockdown issue but uh, an issue which is so much more integrated with other social science uh, aspects uh, uh, let me just touch upon uh, three uh, areas. One is that there is so much uh, discussion going on uh, uh, in the literature that is coming my way around rebooting the economy. And while everyone is talking about uh, this being an opportunity to reboot the economy, this being an opportunity the way we see uh, the use of, uh, let's say, capital in a modern economic system. Uh, but uh, I think our discourse on what needs to be done are actually talking about pathways through which this re rebooting has to be done uh, is, is still very myopic. And, uh, and, and I fear that uh, this this opportunity may be lost unless we 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 have uh, a very conscious effort to think of those uh, pathways and of course uh, I'm 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 lesser qualified of course to 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 even point towards those directions uh, but uh, I I think uh, I think that's that's what I at least keep on thinking uh, at the moment. Uh, should the rebooting be done through, let's say, the channels which the SDGs community define? Uh, should it be done through uh, how national development plans need to be now uh, sort of re-engineered or re-imagined uh, is, is up for discussion. Uh, my uh, second point that I want to uh, put uh, or introduce into this, this discussion is how do we uh, reboot uh, 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 or, or, or sort of challenge uh, the global governance mechanisms which impact uh, all of us. So uh, we are very closely looking at the proceedings which are going on around G7 and G20 uh, meetings and of course, uh, the way the heads of states have been responding to this crisis. And if one looks at the quality of uh, uh, leadership, the quality of concern post-war, uh, of course, and if one compares the same with today, uh, there are, of course, things which may be better, but then there are things uh, where we need to do better. And, and I think uh, global governance or reimagining uh, global governance is again another opportunity in this crisis. Uh, my uh, key example would be around building global partnerships. Uh, just a couple of weeks back, uh, we were looking at a world which wasn't willing to enter into global partnerships or arrive at a conclusion uh, on perhaps the most important uh, or relevant issues around climate change, uh, uh, disaster mitigation, uh, uh, trade protectionism, 
uh, so on and so forth. And here we are seeing uh, uh, a time when, of course, uh, all are willing to sort of contribute uh, not only towards the mitigation of uh, COVID, there is a global effort to raise uh, uh, aid flows to, to, of course, all parts of the world. There is a, a willingness to cooperate on better health systems. So, uh, so, so while all this is important, my concern is that it may be short-lived. And this is why I want to put uh, reimagining global governance as, as number two on my list. My final point is related to this, and that's around uh, addressing uh, the global uh, systemic concerns going forward. So uh, how does one connect the current crisis phase through which we are passing through with uh, the, 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 the already existing uh, global systemic concerns that, for example, uh, one is having to uh, deal with. So, 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 so I think uh, STPI did a paper, uh, not not in very distant path, where we had tried to identify uh, uh, several systemic concerns, including uh, how the future of work changes. Uh, what, for example, automation of our industry means uh, uh, for workforce, particularly the female workforce, uh, uh, how, how are changing development or aid priorities affecting uh, education and health sector outcomes? Uh, uh, likewise, we looked into how illicit uh, financial flows could impact uh, local area welfare um, and and, um, and and we one also looked at the weak access to uh, or how weak access to greener and cleaner uh, forms of fuel uh, and technology are impacting uh, SDG 7 outcomes so while all of these global uh, systemic concerns are are on the table and researchers would continue to work on them uh, how would these uh, global systemic concerns be uh, impacted uh, by the current crisis phase? I think uh, given that the interlinkages are, are so deep, uh, analyzing and studying those interlinkages is important. Uh, studying those transmission mechanisms through which these global systemic concerns impact our national level economies, society, community uh, is important if uh, we want to uh, sort of piggyback on the policy response which we'll be framing for COVID and, and piggybacking on that policy response so that uh, uh, it, it also lends other results or other advantages in sort of resolving some of these global systemic concerns. There will be uh, uh, sort of economies of scale when we respond uh, to uh, not just one, but uh, multiple policy objectives which have uh, uh, interlinkages. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end over there. One of the uh, confessions and, and maybe realizations uh, has been lately that uh, uh, policy think tanks usually take pride in the fact that uh, uh, we respond uh, uh, quickly to the needs of policymakers, and it's the agility in which, uh, of course, many of these think tanks take pride. Uh, it's their connect with the government, the ability to connect with various tiers of government, uh, which sort of uh, uh, give them uh, a, a sort of key position in the development ecosystem. But I think this current crisis has been a reality check. It's been an eye opener. And even our own ability to respond to the government or, 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 or how fast we come up with out-of-box solutions for uh, 
so much, uh, so many facets of this crisis has been a challenge. So it's a very humbling moment for, for, for all researchers uh, to look uh, uh, into. And, and for me, I think this has been a, 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 a huge uh, sort of change in, in, from, from a mindset point of view. So I'll, I'll just stop over here, Dr. Imran. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, uh, thank you for those comments, Wakar. Uh, I'll, I'll come to the uh, audience soon for their questions, but I just wanted to see if uh, Noshin or Danish had any thoughts on what Bakar just said. Uh, okay. I, let me just very briefly chime in. Uh, thank you, Wakar uh, Saab, for that a very interesting and uh, uh, noteworthy and important uh, points about uh, global governance. Uh, I think that um, when in in this present context of rethinking global governance uh, at uh, one the, the question of scale remains also incredibly important that we don't lose sight of the fact that within the global there lie many many different scales of the local as well and that these must remain interconnected and often uh, in these global partnerships uh, there is you know this, this sort of gap emerges where um the lo local contexts get left out uh and 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 that happens quite easily it's uh, it, it's not because people intended for that to happen or they are uh poorly intentioned or or by, you know that their intentions are bad but that generally happens that way um uh, and i'm all for partnerships but partnerships have meaning when knowledge once again and i reiterate uh, the very important point that danish made earlier when knowledge is also grounded and when partnerships also link up with the ordinary citizens on ground and take them forward and and once again i am going to uh, bring up the south africa case because it i find it very inspiring in terms of what the ministry of uh, human settlements has been doing over there and I, I bring up that uh, particular case because I came across them at the World Urban Forum recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, when I was in Abu Dhabi. And I was blown away by the kind of partnerships that the policymakers have made with ordinary citizens on ground in, uh, in, in for addressing numerous uh, uh, challenges, not only challenges of in inadequate housing, but what comes with that because it's all interconnected right so we tend to think in terms of uh the separate categories housing kostra deal you know housing et cetera, tissue hai, pani et cetera, tissue hai, health et cetera, tissue hai, but it's all interconnected and then when we start looking at sort of the built environment and it's and it's uh, socio-spatial political economic ecological dynamics everything is interconnected and separate karna uh, useless hai bilkul. and usme phir local partnerships taking people Logon ko saat le kar chalna. This is, you know, this is so important. So within the sort of, as we try to reimagine this uh, uh, framework of global governance, the importance of the local, of local knowledge systems uh, must remain at the forefront of the agenda. And the SDGs, uh, thinking about rethinking global governance through SDGs is not a bad idea. But even SDGs, the SDGs in terms of how they've been set uh, there are many different gaps, uh, you know, in that. And uh, one of the things that my colleagues and I at the Karachi Urban Lab are trying to work on, and hopefully we will be taking out a policy brief in the coming months, is that when we think about housing and we think about gender and poverty, ke uske kya linkages hai? and the way that the SDGs come at that is actually uh, not so straightforward. I know there are, there are lacunae, there are gaps in knowledge over on, on those issues also. So working with local partnerships, working with people on ground, whether these are community activists or NGOs, and I cannot, you know, keep stressing the importance of these kinds of, you know, these kinds of partnerships. So that's the only point that I would like to make. Let me now turn to Dr. Saleri for his uh, input uh, and comments. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Imran. First of all, I Danish Mustafa or Nasheen or Vakar Tinoka. Shukriya da karna chata hu. Very thought provoking uh, uh, inputs. Or uh, definitely your questions. Uh, Sare, those are extremely thought provoking. Answers the STPI say. I, I would like uh, them to uh, do uh, some research on these uh, uh, points which are raised and perhaps uh, uh, 
uh, this time work from home they can uh, take to uh, further read about these topics uh, uh, build their theoretical uh, uh, foundations on it uh, just some questions uh, which were asked i'll uh, uh, i'm tempted to uh, address some of them uh, pehli cheez to ye hai ki humne dekha hai uh, different countries uh, they have been doing uh, uh, different things to uh, cope with this uh, pandemic uh, with different results uh, our uh, isi tarike se mukhtalif mamalik ne where they try to replicate the success stories again they have uh, varied results and uh, the question uh, to me boils down to uh, apart from many other uh, aspects and uh, many other things which are uh, said here uh, or danish or nosheen ne communist party or mkm ke bare mein jo kuch uh, misale di i think i totally endorse them lekin ek aur cheez jo yahan pe uh, uh, it works is uh, coordination and collaboration ki aapke jo systems hain aur jo institutions hain uh, which are mandated to deliver वो कितने ज्यादा साइलोज में काम कर रहे हैं या एक दूसरे से मिलके काम कर रहे हैं अब अगर मैं पाकिस्तान के केस में देखता हूं तो वी हैव प्रोविंस विच आर ट्राइंग टू डील दीज थिंग्स डिफरेंटली कोई भी जो फेडरेशन होगी खा वो यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स है या पाकिस्तान है उसमें जब तक तमाम प्रोविंस और तमाम स्टेट मिल एक रिस्पॉन्स जो है वो नहीं बनाएंगी लेट से कि अगर सिंध जो है वो इंडेफिनेट लॉकडाउन पे रहता है और पंजाब में इसको रिलैक्स कर दिया जाता है या बलोचिस्तान में या केपी में रिलैक्स कर दिया जाता है तो सिंध जितना मर्जी इसको ट्राई कर ले अल्टीमेटली जिस दिन भी सिंध उसको रिलैक्स अपना रिस्ट्रिक्शन जो है उनको थोड़ा सा भी लूज करेगा वहां पे पैंडेमिक आ जाएगी और ये हम न्यूयॉर्क और वॉशिंगटन में होता हुआ देख रहे हैं इसी तरीके से अगर हम सोशल प्रोटेक्शन को देखते हैं तो सोशल प्रोटेक्शन में सूबे और फेडरल गवर्नमेंट दे आर ट्राइंग टू रेप्लीकेट Uh, rather duplicate uh, their initiatives aur usme sind ki shikayat ye hai ki sind ko bhi tak bisp ka data jo hai us tak access ke nahi di ja rahi hai again agar isko kisi tarike se coordinate kar liya jaye aur unka kuch collaboration ho sake to shayad cheezein jo hai wo zyada behtar deliver kar sakti hain do cheezein jo ke main missing dekhta hu is sare context mein ek punjab mein local governments ka na hona i think वो इस वक्त एक मेजर डेफिशिएंसी नजर आ रही है इसका ये मतलब नहीं कि सिंध में अगर आपके पास यूनियन कौंसल और हैं तो वो बहुत ज्यादा एम्पावर्ड हैं या बहुत ज्यादा बेहतर काम कर रही हैं शायद वहां भी इम्प्रूवमेंट की जरूरत है लेकिन पंजाब में लोकल गवर्नमेंट का ना होना जो है वो इस वक्त एक मेजर चैलेंज बना हुआ है वो लोग जो कि एस कर रहे हैं एट पे उनको जो पे मैसेज आता है वो ये आता है कि जी आप अपनी जिले इंतजामिया से रबता करें नाउ एक्सेसिंग द डिस्ट्रिक्ट एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन इन अवर पंजाब सोशो इकोनॉमिक सेटिंग खाप उसके किसी पटवारी के ऑफिस में भी जाना हो या किसी नंबरदार के पास भी जाना हो तो इट इज हेल लॉट ऑफ जॉब कि आप किस तरीके से वहां पहुंचेंगे कितने रेफरेंसेस लेके जाएंगे और इस सारे लॉकडाउन के सिनेरियो में वो शायद वहां तक नहीं पहुंच सकते अगर इस वक्त यूनियन कौंसल्स होती यूनियन कौंसल्स के चेयरमैन होते कौंसल्स होते तो शायद लोगों के लिए बड़ा आसान हो जाता यानी गवर्नमेंट की एक जो अच्छी इंटेंशन है जिसके तहत वो आ, कुछ आ, जो एडवांस में देना चाह रहे हैं लमसम अमाउंट टू सर्टन बेनिफिशरीज पोटेंशियल बेनिफिशरीज वो भी नहीं हो, हो पा रहा इफेक्टिवली ड्यू टू लैक ऑफ लोकल गवर्नमेंट और एक और चीज जो इसमें ऐड में करना चाह रहा हूँ डेट इज वी आर नॉट अफेक्टिवली रादर नॉट यूटिलाइजिंग एट ऑल द पोटेंशियल ऑफ मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ इंटर प्रोविंशियल कोआर्डिनेशन और द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल फोरम विच इज कॉल्ड सी सी आई कौंसल फॉर कॉमन इंटरेस्ट तो इस वक्त जो हमारी नेशनल कमांड एंड कंट्रोल अथॉरिटी है वो ऑपरेशनल लेवल पे तो कोऑर्डिनेशन कर सकती है लेकिन जो पोलिटिकल डिफरेंसेज आएंगे उनको रिजोल्व uh, करने के लिए जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ने एक प्लेटफॉर्म uh, हमें दिया है जो फॉरम दिया है सी सी आई का uh, और आई पी सी का मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ आई पी सी उसको uh, मेरे ख्याल में uh, हमें यूटिलाइज करना होगा अगर हम एक बेहतर तरीके का रिस्पॉन्स जो है वो uh, देना चाह रहे हैं uh, इसी के साथ हम आल्सो जब रीथिंकिंग डेवलपमेंट की बात हो रही है तो आई थिंक वन ऑफ द थिंग्स दैट कम्स वेरी क्लियर आउट ऑफ दिस पेंडेमिक एंड आल्सो फॉर पाकिस्तान एज वेल कि अभी तक जो हम डेवलपमेंट में और सोशल सेक्टर में स्पेशली हेल्थ को हम एक ऐसी सर्विस समझ रहे थे जो कि प्राइवेट सेक्टर में इट कैन बी बॉट एंड सोल्ड अगेन सेम एज इन यूनाइटेड स्टेट और मैनी अदर डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज Uh, अब शायद हमें अंदाजा हो रहा है कि हेल्थ सेक्टर को जब तक आप पब्लिक हेल्थ सेक्टर इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर को 
स्ट्रेंथन नहीं करेंगे तब तक ये चीजें जो हैं ये शायद नहीं चल पाएंगी आगे और आई एम क्वाइट ऑप्टिमिस्टिक कि वंस एंड वेन एवर दिस पेंडामिक इज ओवर पर जो फोकस होगा एस का वो एक इसकी एक इनडायरेक्ट बेनिफिशरी होगी कि स्टेट्स को अब कन्विंस नहीं करना पड़ेगा लोगों को कि वो एस पे ज्यादा फोकस करें आई थिंक स्टेट्स विल बी कन्विंस्ड ऑलरेडी के द डैमेज अमाउंट ऑफ डैमेज जो ऑलरेडी उनको हो चुका है इस पेंडेमिक के नतीजे में उसके बाद शायद वो अपना जो बेसिक सोशल सेक्टर डेवलपमेंट है उसको थोड़ा सा ज्यादा फोकस करें एंड माई फाइनल पॉइंट इज अबाउट रूरल इकोनॉमी इन द कॉन्टेक्स ऑफ पाकिस्तान अभी तक शायद हम इस पेंडेमिक को डील कर रहे हैं मोर एज एन अर्बन चैलेंज जो सारा का सारा फोकस है वो कराची लाहौर हैदराबाद मुल्तान जो बड़े शहर हैं पिशावर कोयटा वहाँ तक महदूद है अभी तक हमने इसको रूरल एरियाज और विलेजेस की तरफ नहीं देखा है और मुझे खदशा ये है और मैं दो तीन दफा इन्हीं फोरम्स पे इसको रिपीट कर चुका हूँ कि जो नेक्स्ट वेव ऑफ पेंडेमिक पाकिस्तान में आने का खतरा है डेड फुट भी इन विलेजेस एंड डेड फुट भी फ्रॉम डेली वेजर्स एंड इंडस्ट्रियल वर्कर्स हु ड्यू टू लॉकडाउन हैव मूव फ्रॉम अर्बन सिटीज टू विलेजेस अगर उनका कोई एक दो परसेंट भी पोटेंशियल कैरियर हुआ तो वो डेफिनेटली वहाँ पे जाके जो विलेजेस की जो सोशो इकोनॉमिक सेटिंग है और जो वहाँ पे हेल्थ इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर है तकरीबन ना होने के बराबर तो अगर ये वहां पे फैल गई तो फिर हमारे लिए एक बहुत बड़ा डिजास्टर सीन होगा और ये जो हम लॉकडाउन कर रहे हैं इसमें हमें शायद उसके लिए प्रिपरेशन करनी चाहिए कि कम अज कम तालका लेवल तहसील लेवल तक हमारी तैयारी होनी चाहिए कि अगर ये खुदा न खास्ता देहाती इलाकों में फैलती है तो उसको हम किस तरीके से कोप कर रहे होंगे लेकिन इसके साथ ही जो सिल्वर लाइनिंग है वो ये है कि अभी तक अगर इस सारे लॉकडाउन के बावजूद पाकिस्तान में कोई आपको और पैनिक होल्डिंग बाइंग और होल्डिंग के बावजूद अगर अभी तक आपको कोई एसेंशियल फूड सप्लाईज की कोई शॉर्टेज नजर नहीं आ रही तो डेट इज बिकॉज ऑफ अवर सप्लाईज फ्रॉम विलेजेस तो इस वक्त हमें रूरल इकोनॉमी पे फोकस करना है स्पेशली वीट पे पल्सिस पे डेयरी पे लाइफ स्टॉक पे ये हमारी लाइफ लाइन है अगर खुदा न खास्ता ये लॉकडाउन या ये जो सिलसिला है लाइफ जो इस वक्त न्यू नॉर्मल है अगर ये पाँच छः महीने और चलती है तो ये तभी इसको पाकिस्तान जैसे मुल्क में चलाना मुमकिन होगा जब तक हमारी रूरल इकॉनमी इंटैक्ट रहती है अगर रूरल इकॉनमी बैठ गई तो फिर ये सारा का सारा जो अर्बन सेटअप है ये भी कलेप्स कर जाएगा सो आई थिंक दीज आर सम ऑफ माई थाट्स ऑन रीथिंकिंग डिवेलपमेंट एंड ऑल द क्वेश्चन एंड वेरी productive uh, interventions jo hame floor se aur speakers ki taraf se mili thank you imran is sir uh, for contextualizing uh, the state of affairs uh, very helpful uh, with this i just want to thank uh, uh, the presence here of uh, danish mustafa and ushin anwar and our own dr wakar uh, really appreciate it it's, it's definitely been a en- en- very enriching uh, and thoughtful discussion that uh, i'll come back to again and again just to see ke iske andar se kya cheeze hum आगे लेके जा सकते हैं थैंक यू आल्सो टू द पार्टिसिपेंट्स फॉर देयर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चंस। बहुत शुक्रिया एंड हैव अ गुड डे।